Welcome, everybody, to our panel discussion on manual defibrillation and pacing. We have uh, several people here joining me on the panel that uh, I think will provide some uh, robust insights as to what you should be thinking about uh, when trying to purchase these types of technologies. Uh, joining us from West Central Michigan or Central West Michigan, whichever the case may be, is uh, Mel Oakley. Mel, could you uh, introduce yourself briefly for us, please? Sure. Thanks, Mick. Uh, my name is Mel Oakley. I'm a critical care paramedic and agency director. Uh, also run a con consulting education company doing initial education for most levels of EMS uh, throughout our state. Um, glad to be here. Thank you. Wonderful to have you here, Mel. Also joining us is uh, Rom Duckworth. Rom, a little bit of background on you. Sure. Um, I am a career fire captain and the paramedic EMS coordinator for the Ridgefield, Connecticut Fire Department and also an EMS consultant and educator. Excellent. Happy to be here with you, Rom. And uh, also joining us uh, from Pittsburgh is uh, Dr. Vince Macesso. Vince, a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure, Mick. Um, I'm an e emergency medicine and EMS physician. I've been involved in EMS since my days as a paramedic uh, back in 1980 and uh, continue to work with a lot of EMS agencies in Western Pennsylvania. Excellent. So what I'd like to start out talking about is, you know, I want to focus on the defibrillation element uh, of our monitor defibrillators. Considering your experience working with defibrillator monitors over the years, what sort of specifications or features or functionality is most important in your mind when you go to buy one of these things? Mel, I'm going to start with you. So it's got to be, it's got to be uh, lightweight. You got to be able to carry it around. You know, the uh, um, boat anchors of the days of past, I, I think are, are, it's time for them to be of the days of past. Um, they've got to be quick to turn on, quick to start up, and uh, charging's got to be as fast as possible. Uh, you know, look at like the uh, high performance models these days where we're just about compressing through defibrillation, certainly through charging. Uh, if we can charge up pretty quick, that makes everybody a little bit more comfortable if they're, if they're choosing not to compress through charging. Um, you know, the, the button's got to be, you know, big enough to see. And, and I, I really like to see these ones that can be used for both BLS and ALS applications. You know, if it can, if it can sit in an AED mode and then be able to be upgraded as an uh, advanced provider arrives on scene uh, in our tiered response capacities here in, in our region, at least, um, the paramedic may not be on the first arriving uh, transporting unit. And that's really important for us not have to change devices mid-game. So I like the ability to switch mid uh, mid arrest to uh, to take over for advanced procedures as well. Excellent point. And you know, one of the other advantages of having uh, the monitor that can do both is sometimes capturing the 12 lead, uh, even by the BLS crews if they do get ROSC. Is that something that you utilize uh, fairly commonly in your scenarios? You know, we haven't been utilizing 12 lead at the BLS level yet. We're still kind of standing up our, our, our BLS capacity, but that's certainly something on the radar that we're looking at is how to do that. Uh, we're looking for the ability to send 12 leads to the responding uh, advanced provider. That's one of the things I'm really interested in seeing is what kind of uh, platforms are out there to say, um, you know, through like a web portal or something like that. So that the, the advanced provider responding with the crew can say, hey, just just go. Um, I'm not close enough yet. Or, hey, why don't you stick around for a minute? There's things that I can offer you. Um, you know, from a systems-wide perspective, that really needs to be adopted systems-wide as opposed to one agency versus another. Um, so I know that what I'm asking for is, is, is a heavy lift. Um, there's some out there that I think can maybe carry that load. So we'll see, we'll see what, what comes out in the future. Well, that's kind of the point of these conferences is, is to point out, you know, to the manufacturers, what are the features and functionalities, not only the most, most important to us, but features we'd like to see. So uh, let me shift to you. What, what, uh, right. what kind of factors into your your analytics uh, when trying to figure out which sort of product you would recommend for her. For me, uh, it's a lot of the factors that Mel had already mentioned balanced with um, a rugged uh, and reliable functioning package as well. Um, certainly, we operate in field environments that are <laughs> suboptimal at best sometimes. And Things get banged around and knocked around and certainly carried on a variety of different kinds of vehicles over a variety of different terrain. 
So um, that certainly can be, a, a, I'm sure, a, a challenge when trying to balance it with that lightweight and portability. And another balance uh, that I consider is um, sort of uh, readability, maybe ease of use. Um, that combination between um, something being small and light and portable and being big enough that I can really read all of the things that I'm trying to read off of the screen quickly and with enough accuracy that it's it's got clinical relevance for me. Uh, and the same thing with being able to operate it, that I don't feel like uh, I need to take out a, you know, a stylet to start hitting buttons that, uh, you know, if I got to mash things down with my, my big fat thumb, it's going to be the right button and the machine's going to do what I'm trying to get it to do. Yeah, and that that is the trade-off, isn't it? Is we'd like big displays, big monitors, big buttons, but we want the whole thing small and light. So, yeah, definitely some some trade-off factors there. Now, when people are going to be watching this particular video, it's going to be immediately after Dr. Macesso's presentation, where he talks about some of uh, these very things. Uh, so, at this point, uh, Dr. Macesso, what I'd like you to maybe comment on is. One of the features that people don't necessarily pay a whole lot of attention to, because I think a lot of people don't understand it so much, is how much impact or lack of impact does the defibrillator waveform have on the, uh, the success of the device in actually doing defibrillation? Hmm. Well, Mick, obviously that's getting into a pretty technical question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, all I would say is that my understanding and having actually been at the headquarters of uh, most of these device manufacturers, they all have very good data and they've done a lot of testing on their waveform. There are, you know, now everyone is using the biphasic waveform in a more generic sense as opposed to monophasic. And that does seem to have some advantages in performance. Um, but then you get into what is the exact shape of that waveform? You know, what is the current it applies? And there are some things not totally known, but all these manufacturers have tested their waveforms and have good data to show the effectiveness of it. Um, and, you know, clinical studies that have looked at this have all shown reasonably comparable effectiveness. Um, so, you know, I think that on the major brands that we usually look at, um, we can be uh, fairly comfortable um, with that. I do, the one thing I do recommend is using the highest energy level available in general, especially now that we're only doing one shock at a time. So there has been a little bit of research showing that if you use that highest level, you get maybe just a small incremental benefit. But to me, what's the point of like, you know, not doing it immediately and, and then, you know, ramping it up. So uh, sometimes there's these recommendations for escalated energy levels. And my feeling is kind of give it your best shot right off the bat and, um, and uh, you know, go from there. Sure. So Mel, you touched on something that, that I wanted to, to drill into in a little bit more detail. And that is, what sort of features and functionalities that aren't there now would you like to see in the future? And you specifically mentioned the ability to communicate with the incoming unit. You know, we've all, you know, uh, are used to the old Johnny and Roy model going, going back a while where we would transmit the information to the hospital, but transmitting it to the, uh, the other arriving crew, particularly if the first on crew is BLS and the incoming crew is, is ALS, uh, I haven't heard that one before, but uh, I want to press you a little bit more. Are there other features or functionalities that you would like to see in these types of technologies? Sure. So one of the things about that that I think would be would be great is if it was more passive, where the, the BLS crew wouldn't necessarily need to uh, push that information as much as it could be retrieved remotely by the by the incoming, you know, advanced crew. So if there was an ability to, uh, you know, not add to the task saturation of our initially arriving BLS crew, um, not to take anything away from the capacity of our BLS crews, but um, these are advanced things we're doing. And if we can get them to put the stickers in the right place and just stop worrying about it, um, that would be great if we were able to have uh, essentially passive uh, data acquisition from our, our um, 
second second do, if you will, uh, providers. And and then to when they make their call, which you know I'd, I'd like to have them, you know, not having goofy voices coming out of the out of the speaker box on these things. But when they make their call to the 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 second do uh, ALS responders to have the have them kind of read in on what's going on with the patient. So any information that's been put into the machine already would be available to the the, the responding uh, crews. Now, if we're going to talk about that, then let's just get all the way into the futuristic side of things and say, you know, really we should be tying our, our EHR solutions to this device as well. And now when we make the move towards transport to wherever we're going, uh, a lot of that information can be pushed as one sort of packet, if you will, which talking about data, that's the wrong word, but um, you know, one big, you know, uh, select data to go forward. Uh, the advanced providers could select the EKG view that was best because you could essentially do you know continuous twelve week monitoring and say that's the snapshot I like that tells the, that tells a story and here's the one to send. You know, activating cath labs and going forward those kinds of things based on uh, you know what we've got without being on scene. Uh, you know, when we look at what our objectives are here is to identify people, you know, who are candidates for more advanced and in, uh, invasive procedures at a facility. That means that the ALS crew really should be um, doing some of these things while they're while they're driving, not the same person <laughs> doing these things while they're driving necessarily. But but if it's an advanced uh, transport, you know, platform coming out, coming on in, then the uh, attendant who's not driving the vehicle at the time could be doing a lot of work while they're while they're driving, and and not be wasting essentially that time uh, closing the gap between where the BLS response crew is and the uh, the advanced providers. Um, you know, this is where, you know, having, having a snapshot of what was happening in the pre-arrest phase, you know, so it was a BLS crew that responded to a chest pain before they arrested, you know, I know we're talking about defibrillators here, but, um, you know, th those sorts of things can really be, be really telling, uh, for, for the advanced providers when we, when we take care of this stuff. So the, the ability to have a, an inclusive platform that has a, a good data stream, as opposed to these, chunked out pieces of data, but like a legit data stream where we have, you know, continuous capnography being, I know it's defibrillator conversation, but if you had continuous capnography readings during arrest, um, being fed through, you know, the, uh, the same, same data stream going to the advanced providers, some of the advanced providers got there, they could basically pick up where the, the BLS providers left off um, and not have that, that turnover, you know, and then to our emergency uh, department colleagues, you know, I'd love to hear what, what the good doctor has to say on this as we, uh, go over him, but like what kind of data stream could be available to them if we're transporting these provider when these patients in and uh, and what kind of decisions could they make if they had some real time data as well while we're while we're transporting in you know if you look at uh, my uh, specific place you know we're, we're a geographical anomaly much like uh, in the movie uh, oh brother where are thou? you know we are one hour from any interventional facility uh, they were two weeks from everything we are one hour from from any interventional facility so um if we can close some of the gap of data gathering and 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 pushing forward the the data that our, our in-hospital colleagues need to make the decisions they need to make then i think we can do some really good care for our patients and not burn up so much time um gathering information and and things of that nature so i i'd, I'd love to hear what what the doctor has to say on this things well i'll we'll get to vince in a minute i'm going to pitch this uh now over to rom what other Features or functionalities would you like to see in a monitored defibrillator? And again, you know, if it's specific to the defibrillator, great. But uh, you know, like Mel did, take a little bit of latitude in your answer about other features and functionality on the monitored defibrillator in general. Well, for me, I think ease of interface is really uh, top on my list, and and it touches on a lot of what Mel had just mentioned. You know, we're we're task saturated um on scene you know really any of us and the more um cognitive load i guess that we have to dedicate to navigating a particular interface on the machine we're, we're not only taking more of our brain power away from the clinical picture and managing the scene and all the other multiple different things that we have to do on scene um, but we're also more likely to wind up running into a mistake. And, and maybe it's a small mistake um, that, you know, uh, it doesn't have any immediate clinical, you know, present a clinical danger to the patient. But now we have more troubleshooting, which is more cognitive load. So I think that the, as much as we want more features and sort of, and I think sometimes the manufacturers want to give us more doodads, the more streamlined our interface and our ability is to get to those key features that we want to use, I think the, the, the better product we have because it's going to provide 
us a better path to helping the patient. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point because it ties, ties back to what Mel was talking about before. The things that we can automate and just kind of put in the background, it is an additional doodad, but if you don't have to interact with it, if we know that the hospital needs the 12 lead and we're doing a 12 lead, if it automatically pushed it without you having to make an overt action to do that or somehow configuring it ahead of time to do it, letting other people on the response team know what's going on in real time. Uh, yeah, I, I agree though. That would really decrease the cognitive load. Dr. Macesso, if you could comment on, from your perspective, you know, looking at this both as an EMS physician and an emergency department physician, uh, do you see much utility from, from your side of the equation in getting some of that data real time or do the snapshots that you're provided at the time of patient handoff sufficient? Uh, great question. And I, you know, first of all, I want to say what Mel brought up, I think is really innovative as far as this not just being transmitted at some point to the hospital, but also to say advanced level providers when maybe some initial treatment by a BLS or intermediate provider. I think that's would really be helpful. And then depending on the situation, especially with sick patients or prolonged transport times, I think getting that information to what we call in our area here, a medical command physician or for a medical consult well, could really be helpful. And especially if we could be monitoring that screen along with the EMS crews, they don't have to be continuously you know, communicating with us, but after that initial report, we can kind of watch for any significant deviations and and also having that 12 lead ahead of time can really help solidify, do we need to activate the cath lab? Um, our cardiologists sometimes like to see those. So I think the more interoperability or interactivity we can get there, it may not be necessary in all cases, but in certain cases, I think that could really be invaluable to help with that, you know, taking the most advantage of what that medical consult could provide without, you know, causing unnecessary work for the crew that's right there on scene. Yeah, no, I see that point completely. And kind of coming back to one of Mel's earlier points about interfacing with other crews, I, I'm curious to what extent you have issues with uh, pad and cable compatibilities. Mel, could you comment on that? Do you have any issues with uh, your units or, or they right all? Now Go ahead. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all, we're kind of a single, um, single source system at where we're at, you know, uh, you asked us not to use names, so no names, but everybody in our, in our neighborhood is using the same, the same one. Uh, so we've really had no issues with that so far. Uh, the only time we run into any kind of trouble is with public access fibrillation, but you're probably always going to run into that uh, because there's a gazillion of them out there. Um, but so far, all of our first responders are using the same uh, manufacturer. We are, um, you know, and, and our neighbors are using the same ones as well. Different models in many cases, but, you know, same manufacturer. So the interface is, has been fairly seamless. Um, I recognize that some of the things I've suggested would, would change that probably drastically. Uh, and that's where a pocket full of adapters might help you out, but, um, we haven't had that problem yet. Well, and, and maybe even it's not a, a pocket full of adapters. Maybe it's just a standard interface that, uh, you know, I don't have to have a different thumb drive, you know, to, uh, to work in, in any computer right. other than my most recent Apple, which now has this USB C port on it instead of, the regular USB ports, but that sort of thing notwithstanding, you, you kind of see my point is maybe not the adapters, but if it was a, a standard cabling. To what extent do, do you have any issues with, with that, Rami, or do, does your market, uh, because of those factors, have they all gravitated toward the same platform as well? Um, <clears throat> much the same platform, uh, at least for us regionally. Um, one of the things, um, that we do sometimes get frustrated with, however, is even uh, challenges connecting some of the different connections um, within the same um, monitor defibrillator unit. Um, sometimes, uh, understandably, many of these manufacturers are, are bringing in technology from, from 
other manufacturers. And certainly, like you say, when, you know, when any aspect of technology, our, our laptop, our, our tablet computers, whatever, they start to upgrade, um, there are going to be some different connections involved. And I certainly recognize that. But um, laptop and computer technology is definitely moving towards more streamlined and universal connection systems and, and if it can be done on our high technology devices you know uh, these are certainly high technology devices don't get me wrong um uh, uh but if i guess if it could be done on non-medical devices i don't see why it cannot also be done on medical devices so i'd love to see uh as you said more universal um connectors um between manufacturers across upgrades uh, as we go or we're collecting these i'm sure i'm not the only one that have a collection of all different types of connectors even from the same manufacturer stuffed in our ems supply closet just just in case something comes back and we have to start using it again yeah yeah uh how about in the pittsburgh area dr Macesso? have you had interconnectivity issues there uh so, you know, with uh, in the city, fortunately, uh, they've generally been able to have some consistency there. Um, and, um, you know, we have a lot of different services. So uh, that is sometimes a challenge. Um, I agree it would be ideal if we could have, you know, uniform connections and make it easy. Um, unfortunately, even in the ED when, um, you know, EMS or helicopter patients arrive, we sometimes have to change off and put new pads on. And, you know, obviously that's certainly a concern with uh, pacing. Um, so, you know, the more universality there could be there, I think that would certainly, you know, improve patient care. Yeah, because I, I think we've had a tendency to think about these connectivity uh, compatibility issues between uh, first in and second in units, uh, but brings up a great point. Uh, you know, th these pads are not inexpensive. So to the extent that we can leverage those things as much as possible between the public access defibrillator pads and the handoff to the helicopter or emergency department crews on the other end of the spectrum, uh, I think uh, would, would be helpful as well. So let me uh, shift us to uh, a little bit different piece of this and that is the data extraction out of the defibrillator. And yes, we have a, a separate uh, section uh, of the conference talking about the data issue, but as it relates specifically to the record of defibrillation, I, I think it, it's relevant, particularly with regard to public access defibrillation, because sometimes by the time EMS arrives, what we hope would happen is that uh, the patient already has ROSC, uh, but, as Dr. Macesso mentioned earlier, uh, the, the cardiologist, uh, the electrophysiologist, et cetera, may really want to see what that ECG looked like. Maybe when the pads were, were first put on, they hadn't gone into a rest yet or were going in and out. Um, how do we get the data out of these devices and put all the pieces together from the PAD, from that first end unit, the second in unit, and then perhaps to the emergency department uh, or the helicopter transport service, and then to the emergency department. So we've got several devices here that may be touching the patient. Um, have How have you tried to address this issue or has it uh, been something that you just aren't dealing with because uh, it is such a, a Gordian knot to untie? Mel? Uh, you're kind of out uh, by yourself out there. How do you deal with these issues? Um, <clears throat> well, I think you I think you put it well with the uh, Gordian knot there. That's uh, that's kind of where it is right now. Um, luckily, if you will, um, and only in the context of this conversation, uh, we are a pretty remote, pretty rural area with not a lot of public access defibrillation in our uh, in our district. We have first responders with with uh, defibrillators, which I, I kind of covered, are, are very uh, similar to ours, but they're not, in many cases, gathering much data, uh, much to our chagrin. Um, you know, right now, we're basically throwing our hands up in the air and saying, hey, we're getting data out of our EMS monitors. Yay. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, I think I think you know where, I, where my desire would be, and that's, that's to have a, a constant stream of data that we'd able, be able to, to draw from to, to really dial in what we know. For right now, it's it's we're not where we'd like to be. 
So a bridge, I don't bridge have much too far to today. That part. Yeah. How about you, Ram? Well, a little bit less rural, but um, somewhat really uh, lining up with what Mel has already said. Um, we're in very much the same situation, even though we're a relatively affluent suburb of, of New York City. Um, we've got good funding for more public access defibrillation, but I think our, our uh, even then our wants and needs into uh, being able to get that data and and especially to be able to have it presented in a timely fashion in a, in a way that's going to be usable. I think a lot of times larger organizations tend to have more the ability to have somebody dedicated to be a specialist in just acquiring this information and in, in, in interpreting it, in um, making it actionable for the organization and individual clinicians and, and education programs. Um, I, I, my hope would be for manufacturers to be able to assist even the smaller organizations in just being able to gather that info and, and, and put it together in a more actionable way. And again, I, I know you've got separate panels discussing that, but, uh, but uh, I, I think it, it really comes to play when we're talking about defibrillation and, and, and all of uh, the information that surrounds resuscitation that we're talking about here. Sure. Now, Dr. Macesso, you kind of get involved with this at, at two different levels, though. One is in real time as an emergency department physician trying to treat the patient that's in front of you, uh, but as an EMS medical director and looking at the systems view, not just for a particular uh, fire-based EMS service or third service EMS agency, but for the system of, of care, uh, how much of an issue is this data transfer thing? Is it kind of a uh, more of an, uh, an elective sort of thing? Or is this something that you think is a real legitimate need to be able to integrate these data sources together to look at a complete picture? Yeah, Mick, I mean, I do think uh, we do need to do a better job at this. The, you know, for a real-time patient ED, usually the crew can maybe print out sort of a summary or some of the initial 12 leads or rhythm strips and can show that to us. Um, and then subsequently that may get into our EMR, but it may be delayed so that it's not there in real time. So, you know, we have some access there. Um, we have, you know, there's the capability of transmitting 12 lead ECGs and yet that is still, you know, fraught with hazard. Um, you, you know, dependent on certain technology. One of our larger services has a phone that's not compatible or, you know, there's so many logistical issues with that that I think would really help the overall system if, you know, that interconnectivity can get um, improved. I know there's a big push in showing interoperability of the EMR now through CMS and I think other government entities. And so including the pre-hospital component of that, I think could be extremely helpful. And as you mentioned, uh, electrophysiologists earlier, a lot of times that can be really critical is, you know, what was the actual rhythm the patient had? And um, that could really determine, you know, significant therapeutic intervention. So, um, getting all this information tied up uh, would ex be extremely beneficial, I think. Well, excellent. Well, we've covered, I think, uh, a lot of, you know, vital points that uh, uh, I, I think our manufacturer colleagues are all going to be interested in hearing. But even more importantly, for the purposes of this, this conference, is things that the EMS decision maker should kind of keep in mind as they're contemplating, you know, what are their options in, in terms of these technologies, things to walk, look for, watch out for, take into consideration in making that purchasing decision. So as we wrap up this panel, uh, I'd like to invite you to start putting questions uh, into the question queue. Uh, when we go to the live session, that'll start in just a few moments. Uh, so we'll see you over there shortly. Thank you. <laughs>